Praise the Lord. If you're joining us on Vimeo, service will begin in five minutes. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, 
Uh, don't really have any announcements uh, today, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into prayer, and then we'll get into our worship service here this evening. Glory to God. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be in your presence. We invite you, Lord, to have your way in this tabernacle. Lord, move among your people. Lord, you said we're two or more gathered in your name. There you are in the midst of them. And we invite you, Lord God, to have your way in this house. We thank you for it. We give you all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord here tonight.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, you're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. You may be seated here this evening. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to have each and every one of you here today. We got a pretty good crowd online. Thank you for being with us here this evening. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. If you're online with us, give us an amen. Let us know you're there. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> just a few real quick uh, prayer requests. Obviously, we want to continue praying for our nation. We want to continue praying for our leaders. Uh, also, please remember uh, Sister Rena uh, and her family. And also, remember to continue to pray for Mom. She is doing better, but uh, I'm sure she still covets your prayers as she is continuing to recover from the Rona. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and all the implications thereof. Hallelujah. Um, if you have an unspoken request, you'd signify by raising your hand here today. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord right now and ask him to touch all of our needs. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Well, Lord, we thank you for all that you do and all that you have done for us. We ask you, Lord God, that you would have your way, that you would touch lives, touch hearts. Lord God, whether it be a need of healing or deliverance or salvation, God, whatever it is, we know that you are more than able, you're willing, and God, that you desire to be touched by your people. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that when we come to you, we know of a surety, Lord God, that you hear and you answer our prayer. God, that you care, oh God, about our infirmities. You care, oh God, about our situations. You desire, Lord, to be a part of our lives, and we thank you for it. We give you the praise and the glory because there is no one like you, oh God. Let no man glory in your presence, oh God. As healings are unfolded, as lives are touched, God, let no man glory in your presence, but God, that you and you alone would receive the praise. We thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Do we have a special tonight, sis? Okay. Let's uh, worship with her as she sings. I do apologize to everybody online. I didn't have my mic on through all the song service. <laughs> we didn't even notice. Yeah. I know. <laughs>
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Having that relationship with Jesus makes every day so much better. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't, I don't know how people do it living in this world today the way it is without the Lord on their side. I'll tell you. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And uh, I... Uh, I want to turn your attention here this evening to the book of Amos. The book of Amos, chapter number 8. Um, this is a message that the Lord laid on my heart during our recent fasting and prayer. And um, don't know what it's for, don't know who it's for, don't, you know, God didn't give me any details. He just started speaking into my heart and and I wanted to share it. So if it's for you, fantastic. If it's for me, wonderful. I need it. It's kind of like one time somebody told my pastor, said, you know, he was getting aggravated. He, he, they were in a, a heated debate, and, and the guy wasn't winning. And he said, well, I'm going to pray for you. And my pastor said, well, that's good. I need the prayer, and you need the practice. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Amos chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 11. I'm going to be reading from the New King James here tonight. <clears throat> Amos chapter 8, verse number 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day, the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that you would touch us. Help us, O oh God, to hear and receive from your word. Help me, O oh God, to deliver this message as you have laid it upon my heart. Lord God, and I pray that it would touch the hearts of hearers tonight. Help us, O oh God, in our endeavor to be more like you. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Tonight I'm talking to you from this thought, wandering in the wilderness. Wandering in the wilderness. <coughs> you may be seated. Death Valley is a desert in eastern California situated in the northern Mojave Desert and bordering on the Great Basin Desert. It represents one of the most hot and barren places on the planet. Temperatures in Death Valley often rise into the triple digits. Annual rainfall averages 
You ready for this? Two and a half inches a year. Millions of tourists visit Death Valley every year. But very few... <coughs> very few will dare to venture into Death Valley during the summer. According to an article I read in Reader's Digest, one morning in July of 2010, Donna Cooper and two of her friends, Gina and Jenny, ventured into the 125 degree heat and got lost in Death Valley as they looked for a tourist destination because their GPS began leading them in circles. Reader's Digest said travelers have been losing their way in Death Valley, often fatally, since 1849, when pioneers began using it as a shortcut to California's gold fields. Recently, growing numbers have been led astray by GPS devices whose databases for such remote areas such as Death Valley include maps that have not been updated for decades. Donna and her friends attempted to call 911, but they had no cell service. They got lost with three 16-ounce bottles of water, two apples, a few chips, some cookies, and a quarter tank of gas. When they failed to return home for supper that evening, their friends and their families became concerned. And by 10 p.m., the ladies had had to pull over for the night and rest. Donna told her friends that night, said, don't be scared. We just need to have a plan to get out of here. And so they began to write out the words help with stones that they gathered. They built a fire pit to keep them warm. And they even used a CD from their car to reflect light as they watched a passing airplane pass over, hoping that they could signal the plane. The next morning, they tried to start their car, but their car wouldn't turn over. Finally, they went out and started foraging for some water and some food. They found some cacti which can provide some water. Some of them can provide water and food, and they got some of that and were able to extract a little bit of food and water. They then returned to their vehicle in which Donna said a quick prayer, hoping that this time the car would start. And the car roared to life and took off. So they began their drive again, looking for a way out of the valley when they came across some abandoned looking trailers and within those trailers they found some water and they found some canned goods and for food but the air inside those metal trailers felt like a blast furnace as they opened the doors but they went in and got them some food and some water they were even able to pour out some water into barrels and take a bath and clean up a little bit. By this time, the ladies' families had reported them missing, and eventually they would be found by the highway patrol. However, you could say that getting lost in Death Valley gave these ladies some direction in their lives inspired by a conversation with one of the helicopter pilots who rescued them, Gina decided to enroll in nursing school. It is amazing how those kind of experiences can shape and change your life. The wilderness experience can be life-defining if you allow it to. And... In our scripture tonight, the Bible tells us that there are days coming. 
He tells us, behold, the days are coming. Now, the word days there is from an, a relatively unused Hebrew word or Hebrew word, root word meaning to be hot. As the day, as the sun rises, it gets hot. So that's how that comes to be. It's been translated in Scripture as day, days, times, seasons. It literally means the period of a single day, or it can mean a time period. It's the same word that you read in Genesis chapter 1 that God uses when He creates. It's the creative day. It can be a physical day as we know it, 24 hours, or it could be a period of time. Daniel 12, verses 11 and 12 says this, and from the that And from the time of the daily sacrifice that shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the three thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. That's the same word dealing with time periods, not a single day. So we can see that by Genesis, Daniel, and, and Amos, Amos is not speaking of a necessarily a physical day, but rather speaking of a period of time that is to come. Jesus told us that in the last days would come. It talks about the last days. And a lot of people talk about the last days and they think of like 2012 and the Mayan calendar. The only reason the Mayans didn't have a 2013 on their calendar was because they went out for drinks after work one night and never got back to finish it. But he said that in the last days, he would pour out his spirit. And we witnessed this outpouring, we call it the second outpouring, in the 20th century in Topeka, Kansas. It was the launch pad for what would now be the modern apostolic movement. But Paul told Timothy that in the last days, perilous times would come. Men would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy, unnatural, unforgiving, slanders, lacking self-control, brutal, despising good, traitors, hard-headed, arrogant, and hedonistic. He just pretty much said modern day, he could have just, he could have saved himself a lot of breath right there. He just said modern day America. <laughs> I think it's clear when you look at scripture, when you look at Jesus saying in the last days he's going to pour out his spirit, and you look at Paul telling Timothy in the last days perilous times are coming, it is clear we are living in those last days. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that a meteor is going to strike the earth tomorrow. What I am trying to tell you is that our time is short, our labor is multiplied, and we have work to do. Essentially, this world is lost and wandering in a wilderness. God said to Amos during those last days, God would send a famine. But it would not be a famine of food and drink, but it would be a famine of the Word of God. The United States of America is the most prosperous, the most well-fed nation in history. But we lack the Word of God. We lack prayer. We lack truth. We're wandering from sea to shining sea. We're wandering to and fro in search of truth, but we're unable to find it. Why? Because we are unwilling to acknowledge the truth. 
John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. We refuse to acknowledge the truth. We, we would rather chase after the almighty dollar. We'd rather chase after politicians on, that don't have a clue what they're doing. In our text this evening, Amos says that they would be wanderers. He uses the word nuah. Nuah means to waver, to be a fugitive, or to scatter. Our world is wavering, teetering on the brink, rotating back and forth. God asks, how long will you halt between two opinions? They are fugitives from God's grace. Trying to escape the plan of salvation that he has so clearly laid out. They scattered to the four corners of the earth. Trying to find peace when he is the only source of peace. The same word nuah is found in Numbers chapter 32 verse 13. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and he made them to wander nuah in the wilderness for 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. The people had sinned by worshiping false idols and God condemned an entire generation to wander aimlessly through the wilderness. They got oh so close to the promised land. They could, they could see it. I guarantee you, when they brought back those big clusters of grapes, they could actually taste it. But they were never allowed to go in because of their disobedience. Jeremiah 14, 10, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander, Nuah. They have not refrained their feet, therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. You see, they love to wander. They love to get out in the wilderness and just wander around aimlessly with no direction, no purpose, no nothing to guide them or direct them. We just want to wander in the wilderness. They refuse to accept him, the one who can give them direction, the one who can give them peace, the one that can give them truth. And instead of forgetting their sin because they love to wander, he will remember their sin. Lamentations 4, 14 and 15 says, They have wandered, again, Nuam, as a blind man in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean. Depart, depart, touch not, when they fled away and wandered. They said among the heathen, they shall no more sojourn there. They're wandering and stumbling around like blind men in the streets, bumping into things. I have a poor little dog at home. She's getting old and she's getting blind. And if it weren't sad, it would be funny because you go to the door to, to, to let her out and she doesn't know the door you know, is half open and she r runs headlong into the door and she cracks the middle of her skull in the middle of the door trying to get out. That's the way our world is today. They're just wandering around bumping into stuff. They're like the leper out in the middle of the street crying unclean, unclean as body parts fall off. Is that my finger over there? And Amos first used the word nuah in Amos chapter 4 verse 8 when he said, So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. 
yet they have not returned to me, saith the Lord. They're looking for water. They're, they're looking to, for satisfaction, but they're never able to find it because they're wandering in the wilderness and they're not looking at the right things. Our world is searching. They're wandering. They're looking. They're looking for truth. They're looking for hope. They're looking for joy. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for love. But like the old country song says, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. And they're never going to find it because they're wandering in the wilderness. As his people, we're not immune from finding ourselves wandering in the wilderness as well. It's as if this world is determined to take us along for the ride. You know who Anne Frank is, right? Anne Frank, the young girl, Jewish girl, who died under the German Holocaust, had her diary. Anne Frank wrote this. I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. Why is it we can't read and learn from history? We seem to be doomed to repeat it. We just keep wandering back into the wilderness. And the wilderness is scary. The reason the wilderness is scary is because we can't control the situation. But here's the problem. Control really ultimately is a lie of the enemy. You're never really in control. We, you were never in control to begin with. You're not in control now. Either he's in control or God's in control, but you're not in control. But it's that unknown factor that makes it the wilderness. But what is really interesting to me about this wilderness experience and wandering in the wilderness is something else that Amos points out. We've heard messages about the, the wilderness, about the lack of the word of God and so forth over and over again. But the one thing I've never heard preached and to which God spoke to me during our fasting and prayer that I want to share tonight was that passage when he says, In that day the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. And here's the key. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, the sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Bathsheba lives, then shall they fall and never rise again. And I got to asking, what is the sin of Samaria? What does that mean? Well, the sin of Samaria was the ancient goddess of fate known as Ashima. That's the sin of Samaria. Ashima, her name can be translated as the name, portion, or lot. It's related to a Turkish word meaning kismet. Okay, kismet. It means destiny or predetermined future. They're wandering around in the wilderness, stumbling around like blind man, bumping into things, thinking it's all going to work out in the end. It's all part of fate. It's all part of kismet. It's all, it's, it's just, this is the way it's supposed to be. Okay, now. According to the Talmud, Ashima, the idol, was in the form of a bald sheep. That's a scary looking thing. A bald sheep. But what really is fate? We, we often talk about fate. People talk about, well, that's just fate. That's just the way it is. 
Fate is defined as the will or principle or determining cause in which things in general are believed to come as they are or events happen as they do or as the inevitable and often adverse outcome, condition, or end. In other words, fate just means that's the way it was supposed to be. It should, it's going to happen because that's the way it was supposed to be. In Greek mythology, there were the three sisters of fate, Atropos, Clotho, and Lachesis. They were the personification of a person's life and destiny. They decided life, lifespan, and death. They controlled the past, the present, and the future. Clotho is thought to have webbed, uh, weaved the, the web of life. Lachesis would mature the threads, determining the length of life, and then Atropos used the shears to cut the thread, controlling when the person would die. And it's believed that they even controlled the fate of the gods. Many believe in fate in our world because it brings a certain amount of comfort. When bad things happen, fate tells us that it's part of a greater plan, giving meaning to our pain. But it also means that we lack free will and control. This leads us to certain feelings of hopelessness and depression. If there's no point and it's already determined by fate, why even try? If all you are is a monkey who came down out of a tree, what does it matter how you live your life? Fate is like gambling with your soul. Americans used to believe we were in control of our destiny. We had, you think about the pioneers who moved west across this nation and helped make this nation strong and proud. But now we sit on our rumps waiting for our next government handout to come. According to a recent study of Americans during the 2012 election, psychologists found that the more difficult the decision the person had to make on who to vote for, the more they were willing to believe fate would play a role. In other words, we're willing to resign ourselves to a complete state of powerlessness. Yeah, yeah. It's all in the hands of fate. I'm talking about wandering in the wilderness. The sin of Samaria is to be wandering around in the wilderness, bumping into stuff like a blind man, not knowing where you're going, not pursuing anything in particular, not looking for anything grand, not trying to achieve something great, just existing, believing that it's all going to work out the way it was meant to be. Stand with me this evening. James Faust said this, when someone died in the wilderness of frontier America, that person's physical remains were buried and the hand carts continued west. But the mourning survivors had hope for their loved one's eternal soul. However, when someone dies spiritually in the wilderness of sin, hope may be replaced by dread and the fear for the loved one's eternal welfare. What can we do? First off, we've got to, we can't believe in fate. We can't just willy-nilly go through life hoping that the next payday from Uncle Sam is going to get us through. We have to focus on our daily provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. Stop trusting in fate to get us through the wilderness. Like Moses, he led the people through the wilderness. But every day, God provided for them. And we need to understand we have that support system. He, it, our lives are not controlled by fate. 
We're not just wandering through this wilderness of sin without purpose. But we are here because God is guiding. Remember, <coughs> God is our source and we need to trust in Him, not in fate. You see, trusting that everything is going to work out that's not the answer. Yes, the wilderness is scary because it's unknown and you're not in control. And yes, people will suffer. That's part of the wilderness experience too. But from time to time, among all the wandering blind people, all the wandering blind lepers, there's going to be one that stumbles in and finds their way through the door. And they will find rest for their souls. So I want to tell, tell you, I'm going to leave you with this thought tonight. Take heart, church. Take heart. Are we in a wilderness? Yes. But it's not in the hands of fate. We are in the hands of God. God is in control. And he's going to lead us through this wilderness that we have found ourselves in. All we have to do is trust in him. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this people. And I ask you, Lord God, to touch us. Lord, help us to understand that you are with us, guiding us and directing us. Lord, that you have a purpose and you, oh God, are in control. Lord, I ask you tonight, direct, lead, and guide us. Help us, O oh God, not to trust in fate, but to trust in your hand, your provision every day. I thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's worship the Lord here tonight. Holy Spirit, rain.
direct us. Bring us back at the appointed hour, we pray. 